Howdy everybody. Sorry for the long gap between videos. My mother was released from prison shortly after I finished the last one and boy was she in a mood. Moping around the house making everybody's life miserable. I'm sure I don't need to tell you what it's like when a loved one gets released from the big house. Well, at any rate, I've been lying low, hanging out in the barn, mending fences, branding the horses and chickens and so forth, anything I could think of to keep myself out of the house. Unfortunately, that meant I could not get here to my studio. Well, the good news is this. Yesterday, against my better judgment, I suggested that maybe she get her old gang back together. Maybe try to pull off a bank job or something. Her face just lit up. She practically skipped out of the house. Well, as much as a one-legged woman can skip. The last holdup didn't go real well. Anyway, long story short is that I'm back and raring to go. And today I thought I might shift gears a bit. Uh, as you know from my earlier episodes, if I were a Democrat, and, and of course I'm not one, but if I were, then I'd be behind Bernie Sanders. If you recall in my video number nine, I gave Sanders my maximum score of five yeehaws. Elizabeth Warren, she got four, right down to Joe Biden, who was lucky to get one. Pete Buttigieg, you need to keep your mouth shut. The more you talk, the more yeehaws you're losing. Anyway, I wanted to continue with that theme, but with a slightly different focus. And this focus was inspired by the coincidence of two events. One, my beautiful wife and I are going to see the punk band Stiff Little Fingers in Dallas next week. We're going to leave the ugly wife at home. Uh, and two, I recently read how Bernie Sanders' policies as mayor of Burlington, Vermont, cultivated the, cult, the punk scene in the Northeast. Huh. Who knew that Mr. Commie Socialist was also Mr. Anarchy? Well, I got to thinking how symbolic that was, a, a metaphor, if you will. For just as punk was much more real and meaningful than the other crap that passed for music back in the late 70s and early 80s, so Sanders, and to some extent Elizabeth Warren, are much more real and meaningful than the other crap that passes for big D democratic politics today. Hear me out. See what you think. First, the link between Sanders and punk. Now, I got this from a very nice piece in Vice by a fella named Paul Blessed entitled How Bernie Sanders Shaped the Northeast Punk Scene. You might want to search for it. Anyway, the short version is this. When Sanders was elected mayor of Burlington in 18 and, oh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of, of my family's history, in 1981, then among other things, he wanted to have more communication between their politically active youth and the local government. Mr. Sanders asked his future wife, Jane, to look into it. And by the way, they came up with a number of other programs as well, like a, a sliding fee daycare center and help for the elderly shoveling snow. Man, this Sanders guy sounds like a total bastard, doesn't he? Anyway, they found out that what the kids really wanted was an all-ages place to play music. And so 242 Main Street was born, and apparently it's still running. Now, returning to punk, 242 Main Street apparently played host to many punk bands, including some national names, Fugazi and Operation Ivy. And if I may quote from Mr. Bless's article, the impact of 242 Main has had on Burlington music is incalculable, said Dan Bowles, a music editor for Vermont Alt Weekly Seven Days, who wrote a retrospective of the, re of the venue back in January. You would be hard pressed to find any rock musician who grew up in the area that hasn't logged time on that stage at some point. It's where most of us played our first shows and learned how to be in a band. Most of us eventually age out of 242 Maine, but it's a cornerstone in the musical upbringing of local youth to this day. How about that? On a related note, if you want to do a little searching, you can also find an impromptu interview that Sanders did with a couple of decked out punk rockers in a shopping mall as part of his public access cable show. Great stuff. So, Sanders and punk are connected, but why does this make me think of his candidacy? Well, I think for you younger folk, I need to tell you a little bit about old school punk. Now, first of all, you might wonder why a God-fearing patriot like myself would listen to punk rock. Why am I not into Bob Wills or Johnny Cash or Earl Scruggs? Well, I don't dislike them, but that's not where my heart is. To understand my position, you have to know what the world was like in, during my high school years. Here's a selection of the Billboard top songs during my sophomore, junior, and senior years. That's right about 1977-1979. Now, prepare yourself because it's not going to be pretty. Shadow Dancing by Andy Gibb. That was the number one song in 1977, and thank God I don't even remember it. Night Fever by the Bee Gees. You... You light up my life. That's Debbie Boone for you. Uh, tonight's the night gonna be all right. Rod Stewart. 
He often used improper English in his titles, which upsets me, but nevertheless. I Just Want to Be Your Everything by Andy Gibb. The Best of My Life, The Emotions. Do Ya Think I'm Sexy, Rod Stewart again, not speaking English. And Reunited by Peaches, and I always want to say Herb, but it's probably Herb. See, this is why drugs were so popular back in those days. And, and God help me if right now I get any of them songs stuck in my head. But seriously, can you even imagine that this was the best life had to offer me at my high school dances? Put succinctly, music sucked. It was formulaic, it was corporate, and it was about nothing. Why did I suddenly get a picture of Joe Biden in the Democratic National Committee just now? Listen to the opening lines of Andy Gibbs' I Just Want to Be Your Everything. <clears throat> I'm not going to sing it. For so long, you and me been finding each other for so long. And the feeling that I feel for you is more than strong, comma, girl. Take it from me. My God, I could come up with better lyrics by kicking over somebody's Scrabble game. None of this spoke to me. None of it addressed the problems we were facing. None of it took any chances. It was just like the establishment neoliberal Democrats. A lot of flash, a lot of corporate money, but little substance. However, music fortunately had its own kind of revolution, just as we were witnessing today in politics. And my first experience with this kind of revolution was an album I bought on a whim. Never mind the bollocks, here's the Sex Pistols. Now, of course, I had to buy it under an assumed name and in disguise, given where I live and my local reputation, but bought it I did. And it's the only album I ever wore out. I had to buy a second copy. Indeed, there's a third copy in the other room. I played it so much. And this, of course, turned out to be a gateway drug to other bands like Black Flag, The Stranglers, The Buzzcocks, who else have I got here? Uh, X, so that's a wonderful band there. The Jam. And this was music about real life. It was important because of what it said. It wasn't always pretty. Sometimes its hair was ruffled. Sometimes it looked like it had slept in that suit. But it did not shy away from the many elephants in the room. Consider that while Debbie Boom was singing a song that she didn't even write, with inspiring lyrics like this, <clears throat> it can't be wrong when it feels so right, because you, dot, 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 you light up my life. At the same time she was shaking our world with that, The Clash were singing White Man and Hammersmith Pally, filled with commentary on UK race relations, politics, and music. The Damned were singing Anti-Pope. I got nothing against church, only the people who go there. The Macons, I don't own a Macons album, sorry. The Macons were lamenting the fact that they had never been in a riot. And the Gang of Four were analyzing the impact of consumerism and capitalism on our souls and talking about the power of oppression and overthrowing the man. I don't know if you can see this or not. It's a wonderful album cover. Uh, let's see. Uh, it says here, the Indian smiles. He thinks the cowboy is his friend. The cowboy's, wait a minute. Well, it's too late now. Uh, turns out the cowboy's a bad guy in that. Now, so this was real music. Truth, reality, important issues, music for and by the people and not for and by the record industry. I suspect I do not need to review my Democratic National Committee analogy again. And what about the band we're seeing next week? Now, Stiff Little Fingers, they were not asking, do you think I'm sexy? But they were singing about the troubles in Ireland. Suspect Device, Alternative Ulster, Wasted Life, and a beautiful cover of Bob Marley's Johnny Was. All these kids, with practically no support from the corporate world whatsoever, put out a message that meant something, just like you know who. And that who can incidentally help some of those kids. Well, hell, I think I'm even going to change my rating for him. He no longer has five yeehaws. He has six and a gabba gabba head. Thank you very much.